Okay, guys. Um, as they've asked us, we're going to start this. Um, we're um, we're going to step in for Stephanie. Um, we were just in a discussion last um, one that uh, the three of us are from our one's an archivist and the us other two work for our tribe in the school systems and um, have come up a little bit and have background in Native American studies as well. Um, so, what's the guy that hope? There's one of my guys that are Oshana Chano, Sita Diami Washti. My name's Thor Peterson. Um, um, I work for the ACMA Department of Education. I work for uh, a CTAS grant, which is um, a DOJ funded grant for preven per prevention in communities, um, but we've relocated or based it on a model to work in a school. So I work with Haku Community Academy, our newly, um, it's in our second year of being a tribally controlled school. So um, this workshop was, or this uh, National History Day was presented to us and we're gonna run along with it because we think it's a great way to engage our youth. Um, I'll go ahead and let the others introduce themselves. Kawati kaita wa hapa doishina me hishdi ani yaka kuchi nishita eshashka washdi shita. My name is Jonathan. Um, I also come well, like Dorset, I come from Akama Pueblo, um, and I also work at the Haku Community Academy. Uh, I'm one of the I'm a program coordinator for the 21st Century, the after school program. So we do a lot of collaboration, and I'm still fairly new learning the system and stuff, and so I rely on Thor a lot. And it, you know, this when we were presented with this like, with this project, you know, it, we you know kind of thought of you know many possibilities and different ways we can take it, and especially for an enrichment type um, type piece. So um, so once we found out about it, we we want to jump on it right away and. You know, a lot of the information presented today has been really helpful and really useful, um, especially with the research part, because I know it's a, it's a lot. And, you know, for me, being in college, like, research was never my strong point, but it always worked out in the end. But, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so that's me. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Diane Bird. I'm from Santo Domingo Pueblo. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I'm an archivist at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe. I've also been the head archivist and the founding archivist for the National Museum of the American Indian. I was also the archivist or an assistant archivist down at the Indian Public Cultural Center when the um, um, five Pueblos um, which just totally slipped my mind, the water rights case, the Amot water rights case came in and at that time it was still a live case and it still is um, because we keep thinking it's going to end every year and it doesn't. <laughs> but it's a, it's a crucial case and um, it's something that I'll get into later. The reason I attended this was because um, in the exhibit, besides being an archivist, I'm also wearing the hat of um, um, a curator of a section on survival and resilience which tells the story using our voice and our stories and our languages of the history of Native American peoples, at least um, 30 different distinct um, tribal nations here in the Southwest, and that's both Arizona and New Mexico, so we're not confined to New Mexico. So that those stories will be in, in our museum. Okay, um, so what we're going to, the portion I think is cultural competency, I think was the subject of it. So that and kind of we're going to talk into a little bit of the cultural appropriation that might come up with the projects, especially regarding Native um, history, culture. Um, we know nowadays that's a big, big topic now. Um, there's a lot um, more tribes and more people are more outspoken about appropriation for all types of culture, which has um, been a, a mainline issue for a lot of minorities in a lot of areas. So <clears throat> we just got these slides from a moment ago, so forgive me if I, don't, if I have to look this way and not at you guys. Um, but uh, 
So there is 566 federally recognized tribes. That doesn't include the tribes that are self-recognized within other states and within um, in different areas. Um, and then the population of 5.2 American Indians and Native live in the United States and 200 different languages. I know in our state we have five spoken, Karis, Tiwa, Tewa, Zuni, Athabath, and oh, sorry, six, and then Navajo. Navajo. Okay. Um, so we have a diversity here. Um, I couldn't tell you. I just know Karis is like uh, Acoma, Laguna, Santo Domingo, San Felipe, Cochiti. Yeah. Um, that's Karis. So that, but we all have different dialects, much like regional dialects. So some of the words that um, Diane would say would would translate to something else, and or they say it different way than we say it. So um, there's that. Everything has regional dialects as well too. Um, term, terminology, yeah, this one becomes pretty, uh, is pretty rough. A lot of people don't know how to, um, use it, use, uh, like a proper political term for us American Id Indians, sorry, Alaskan Native, uh, Native American, um, personally, I don't, all of those are fine. I don't have a... You know, but peripherally, I'd go with being called Akama myself. If I've identified myself as being Akama, I would prefer you would call me that if I've done that. But if not, if, but it's kind of hard to tell that I'm Native. You know, I look more, uh, I'm part white, so I look more, a little bit more white than, uh, I don't get the full beards out here in the <laughs> Southwest. <laughs> um, and then, yeah. Indian country, I think that we've kind of taken that on of, you know, the Indian country uh, news or paper or online thing. Um, we've just kind of taken it on our own. It's better than saying Indian reservation and stuff like that. Indian country, it's where we live. It's our homeland. Um, as you know, Pueblos most got to keep in their um, homeland, their starting homelands. So for us, it's really dear here. Um, other tribes have been unfortunately removed and such is the long history with Native Americans on the East Coast especially. Um, so I think Indians, Natives in general have taken that and started to own it even though it was kind of a coin phrase at some time but we've you know taken it. It's better than the alternatives and stuff like that. Okay, um, I'll let Diana Go ahead and <laughs> diagnose the, this photo. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the information I was given was that this was the student's um, submission to maybe not New Mexico History Day, but elsewhere. And it was kind of to point out um, some of the things that might be kind of in error about it. And one of them is that President Andrew Jackson literally wanted to wipe off Native Americans um, from, from our country. And he did that by forced removal of at least five to six uh, southeastern tribes from Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and, and parts of, um, I think, South Carolina, and moved them to what is Oklahoma Native Territory. And it is called the trail of tears but oftentimes a lot of people think that we all experienced that situation and we have to be here in new mexico we're we're, we're very adamant by we i mean native people public people um that we have never been moved from um our homelands and um or forced away from it we've had bits and pieces literally taken from us but not not as a whole have we been moved. Um, the Cherokee Rose, I can't comment about that because um, I'm not sure what the Cherokee Rose is. Um, I'm not sure what the sticks um, stand for. Slide to see the okay. Oh, yeah, the little rubber figurines, <laughs> or the plastic figurines. Um, uh, 
those are fun tourist things, but those should not be used on a on a history day to represent Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, Seminole, or Choctaw nations. And that's the other thing is that to keep in mind that every one of these, even though they're called tribes, we are nations and we're respective citizens of our nations. I am a citizen of Santo Domingo or Kiwa. These two are, are citizens of Akama or Haku. So it, we, we have citizenship. We had citizenship. It's just innate within us that we have it. And, and to think of, I can't even think, sometimes I've read the stories, I've seen everything about this, but the, these tribes were nations and they were self-governing. They had their own systems of government, their languages, um, their land, their, their religious practices. Everything is in there and, and, and you don't lose it just by moving from one area, being forced to remove from one area to another one. Um, they may have lost some when they went to Oklahoma, but the reason, and, and I've, I've talked with a person that is from Oklahoma and, I, and she wasn't part of one of those tribes there. And I said, how did you, how did you think of not being considered a civilized tribe? And because that civilized tribe is loaded, um, the rest of us, I guess, are all uncivilized. Um, but um, that's that's a very loaded term to be using right there. But it's a common name that you're going to see, and your students may see that when they're conducting um, research because it is used over and over and over again. And I would try to steer them away from using um, that term, that kind of terminology. Um, um, you can see that um, one of the things is that many um, historians or anybody that's researched with Native American people forgets that we were, we are very intelligent people. We had our systems, like I was talking about. We also had our languages. Um, they created an alphabet there through Sequoia. Um, but we also had scientists. All we have to do is look at Chaco here in New Mexico. Chaco, you had to be an agronomist. You had to know all the sciences of how to grow and process the food and how to maintain it and keep it throughout the year. We had astronomers, we had physicists, we had architects, we had everybody, any type of science that you can probably name. And it, it's all in New Mexico, just, just by looking at that architecture out there and how the people live there. It, it's, it's a really deep and rich symbol of um, how our ancestors had um, technology and had expertise and great knowledge that now we have to go to universities in some senses to retain. My daughter is an environmental engineer and I, at first I congratulated her and she said, Mom, she said, no, there have been environmental engineers. She said, just look at Chaco, just look at Mesa Verde. They, we've had them for a long time. So sometimes it takes learning from our children as well to be reminded of some of these things. And then to kind of speak on the civilized, when they come across it, to be civilized for them was to speak, um, I guess we'll say American at that time, not really, since English at that time was kind of broken still into different parts. Um, you had to do that. You had to dress the norm like they did in the cities. Um, you couldn't have traditional hairstyles like um, I know a lot of uh, the plains and the northerns um, have long braided hair and things like that. To have well kept short hair was also a norm to um, work a job business wise. Um, to be the man of the house. The women were always at the house home taking care of the kids things. Civilized is for the American way at that time, not for their tr traditional cultural ways. So when you come across it, um, just be wary that it is, um, as Diane said, a loaded, a loaded title at that time. Okay, you want to do this one? Mm. Yeah, your turn. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, so please forgive me. I was, you know, unprepared for this presentation. Just kidding. But, um, I mean, I like, you know, the representation of it, you know, I really understand they're trying to hit at, you know, presenting of what they, you know, what they interpret from what they got in their research. But, you know, there's times that a bit much is a little too much. 
And so, you know, the symbolism and, you know, the a lot of the things they, you know, try to interpret and present is good because, you know, it shows their creativity, you know, I give them props. But, you know, there's times where you have to really look at what tribe you're talking about and you also have to research on, you know, what kind of, um, kind of home life they had because, you know, there's that norm and stereotype that, you know, natives lived in teepees and, you know, not technically true. Um, you know, us Pueblos, we were, we have adobe homes and, you know, that's kind of, you know, how we, you know, grew up, or not grew up, but how we kind of established ourselves. But, you know, with more plain Indians, you know, they were always kind of relocating from their lands and, you know, always move in different places. So, yeah, you know, that, um, you know, their kind of home living was through teepees, but, you know, there's, you just have to really dig deep into your research. Um, I mean, just trying to interpret, you know, a certain tribe, a certain nation's living is, you know, it's a lot to consider and it's a lot to really find the, like the real value and reputation of um, this of, you know, what you're trying to, I guess, display and offer. So, you know, um, so yeah. <laughs> and, okay, go. So uh, for that, um, like John said, you have to be wary of the symbols that your children use at times, especially for certain tribes. Um, one of the most notable ones is uh, what we all know here in the state of New Mexico is the symbol of Zia. Um, Zia, <laughs> their case against um, New Mexico is that, you know, that was appropriated a long time ago for to be the state flag. And it's been a symbol and goes to show on pottery that they've had for years that it originates from them. Um, so knowing the symbols and not just kind of just like um, putting things randomly on there, so like this, um, there's depictions of, I guess, the horses and the buffaloes for plains tribes and stuff like that, but we don't know if they, of some plains tribes, had, you know, came in contact with bears at some times. You can't just put a bear over a thing going like that. Um, maybe if it was walking by or something. The sun depends on, like I said, some tribes, if they, um, if the, if the sun had a huge um, centerpiece for them for that. Um, the eagle, I think, is is one of the biggest symbols for all Native Americans across the way, but to do it in the, like, each tribe had, draws their eagles different. Each tribe has um, their different representation of an eagle. So being um, having it a, match appropriately to the tribe that is in the presentation is also something to be wary of. And oh, 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 I was just to say also too like you know and you know if you have students doing research you know on either a specific native tribe or just you know and looking at a lot of you know textbooks you know contemporary or like modern day you know textbooks and stuff you know a lot of that information is very blunt and it's very you know it's just it, it just gives you like very kind of the basic information so if I would recommend, you know, they look at, because you have to look at two different perspectives. You're looking at, you know, what's being presented from this author, but then at the same time, you have to look, you, you have to devour into the native tribe themselves, like how they dealt with it, you know, how they, you know, either overcame or how they conquered, you know, to come over a barrier that they were presented or, you know, just, there's two different perspectives. So I say to, you know, you know, look at what, the, you know, what, I guess the general population thinks, but you also have to look at what the native, how they endured it, how they kind of, you know, made either use or how they, you know, are still kind of dealing with that type of barrier today. So that's, you know, and, you know, and plus too, you know, staying away from like the Hollywood stereotypes of what they kind of portrayed in their movies early on. Especially in the John Wayne movies, you know, it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, you know, that's, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> but, you know, still, that's a perfect representation of, you know, bad representing of Native people is, you know, Hollywood movies early on. Yes? I, I just wanted to say for clarification, this, this picture is still from that um, exhibit. 
Is this the on bottom the part of it? Walk, so they're using the teepee and the plains imagery to depict like the oh, Cherokee the and the Creek. And trail, 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 sorry. Um, so this is that <laughs> still where they're supposed to be writing about the southeastern nations, but they just sort of conflated everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then one of the other things is like the down below. Um, you see the little patterns um, might not necessarily be southeastern. Um, you could see that pattern on a lot of southwestern designs too. <laughs> so just be careful on things like that. Um, to the next one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one just speaks for itself. Um, uh, this is either supposed to be a dream catcher or a warrior shield. Either way, that's not how they would look. <laughs> um, <laughs> so things like that, I uh, once again, where we would come through um, the kids, most um, all tribes pretty much would deny kids access to something like that for a dream catcher or a shield. Um, they have um, cultural, spiritual, um, significance to tribes um, and they're not things that go with um, to mess around with um, the ones you see in the store you know they're obviously either they're more than likely made in China um, and made with like fake leather <coughs> dyed feathers and stuff like that um, so if your kids have something that does with the planes in it or something like that that would have what they would call an artifact or something like that please um, just be wary that if it is, make sure that they do have permission if it's culturally significant. Um, as we were talking in the other one about um, native, uh, I'm sorry, what was the subject again? Primary sources. Yeah, primary, secondary sources. In that instance, if it's like a family heirloom uh, or like a picture, usually even then, to have those things is, is um, taboo at times. So make sure um, the kids go through you, and if you don't know the answer to that, then there's resources. You can call the cultural center, you can call the local tribe um, to see. Um, but don't just be like, oh yeah, that's go ahead, use that, it's fine. That's the absolute worst thing you can do. Um, because uh, there's plenty of times that's happened and it's not and it turns into a big thing and a legal battle. And I'm pretty sure no kid wants to go be traumatized from a court case and being said they're culturally appropriating on the seven o'clock news or 10, 10 p.m. news. Um, especially with how we said uh, back to the beginning with cultural appropriation is a big thing nowadays. Um, and using something like that, I know that they want to get um, an item that would represent natives or something like that. I think um, you can go back, like down below it has the legal documents that maybe they had, or there's books that can that authors have to, or historians that tribes have, uh, you know, that verify and that are okay with, that they themselves house and show. Or if you have photos from the National Archives or something like that, or from a tribe that allow to like that be on loan or something like that, if the student's tribal member or something like that, then you can use things like that. But once again, you always have to ask permission when it comes to artifacts or items that are have you would think have cultural significance. So that's a no-no. Big, <laughs> big no. Okay. Okay, uh, so I guess this is where we take questions. Uh, I was just going to add another feedback on that last slide, just from the point of view of National History Day. Don't do that to your primary sources. <laughs> um, the primary sources, because so much space in that exhibit is taken yeah. up with something that doesn't contribute to the telling that historical story. I mean, even if it were appropriate in some way, it doesn't add to the story, right? It doesn't tell you anything about the Trail of Tears or um, the, the nations in question, but those primary source documents might actually 
be useful if they were legible, but they're all on top of each other. Yeah, so. like uh, through page protectors in those sleeve in those sleeves, you know, put it through that way they can flip through it. Maybe have the students do a book mm -hmm. that way they can read through and then read it individually through it um, would be one way. Yes. Now, oh, if they were to, let's say they wanted to make a replica, and this could be, you know, a Native American um, youth, and they want to make a replica, um, to me, isn't it appropriate for them, like when we had, we had a um, uh, tribal exhibit, and we identified the replicas as replicas, that they were made by, you know, Isaiah OAS, and uh, would you recommend that for an exhibit piece that it says, this, this is a replica of such and such made by... I think it would, it just depends on what the thing would be, right. that the replica would be, because once again, there are certain items, mm -hmm. um, things that you, you know, you're not supposed to do things, make replicas of. Yeah, I'm thinking more like arrow shafts or um, bow and I mean, addle addle, would that be, would you say that would be appropriate for a, a student to put in an exhibit for? Yeah, uh, probably just no, like, a, use like foam for the point, just nothing. <laughs> you can buy yeah. educator replica trunks from some different places. Like Aztec Ruins has a really great mm -hmm. educator replica trunk that not only has um, K through eight lessons that are appropriate, um, but also all of their replicas are appropriate. Right. And they're culturally sensitive. They're culturally respectful. Right. So I would think that maybe you could steer students towards a, a, a source like that. Where, yeah, where you're or like I said, uh, Office of Archaeological mm -hmm. Studies has... Um, even the Museum of Indian Arts and Cultures, we have um, education pieces that we don't... And they're authentic and handmade or made by Native people, but we just have too many of them, so we put them in education so right. that they can be right. used out there so that people don't have to come to the museum. Right. But we don't do that with all our, all our pieces or all our collections, just certain kinds. But we do have them in our classroom and in trunks, traveling trunks. So those could have gone out. Um, and at different times, we do take out the atlatls, we take out the hand drills. Um, we're very careful with the atlatls because that's the first thing that the kids want to practice with. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I think we don't have plastic on the end, but we have a softer point. Yeah. That that those. is yeah. Yeah. now how about pottery shirts because there's so many pottery shirts out and about right without any providence you know i would what be would careful you... using pottery shirts you can take them out to show the different styles the different clays different designs well i'm thinking the only thing... any... and i'm asking this not i have, I have no students wanting yeah. to do this i'm asking this general for the general but, but population what you don't want to foster is kids going out collecting exactly. um because say there's, I won't mention a Pueblo, but there, most of us have areas where there will be pottery shirts. And it's not fenced off, it's not um, blocked or anything, but we've had people go out there and pick up the pottery shirts yep. and then bring them to the museum for identification. Then when we ask them where they got it, and then they tell us, we're like, oh my gosh. you know. So yeah, you don't want to encourage um, pot shirt hunting on Indian or public lands. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah. definitely not. Anything else? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I would say, you know, making replicas and stuff, you know, I would just say, you know, to have, you know, the students actually know kind of the significance, you know, what it's used for, what they, you know, what, I, what they use to use it for, and, you know, not just making it just to make it and have it there as a display, but also, you know, presenting on that, like, well, you know, this was used, you know, to, you know, uh, for hunting, or this was used, you know, when they were making food, you know, just kind of keep in ties to that specific tribe or that specific nation, just, you know, just to, but yeah, there is, you know, certain, you know, kind of barriers that you have to, you know, keep in mind and certain, you know, things to be, I guess, appropriate with. Yeah, so that's really. And I think that's one of the important things to keep in mind is the, the danger of generalization, yeah. right? And yeah. there's so many, you know, people, you know, and as you all know, tourists that come in that just think that, you know, you all are just one, you know, Native Americans are just, you know, one big, you know, group and there's no differentiation. And I think that'd be a danger for students as well. 
in some parts to make sure that they are identifying what what specific um, you know nation are they talking about? You know what specific pueblo? Because there's so many, and all are so different. You know, so I think that's that's really important. And I think if you're teaching the history of New Mexico, and it should be pointed out that the state that we call New Mexico was once inhabited by different native peoples in every corner, um, and. Um, like for my section of, of survival and resilience, I went down to the archaeological research material section, which is where all the archaeological stuff is. The records are. The records are downstairs. And so I asked um, one of the archivists there um, if they could produce a map for me, because I had read a long, long time ago that when um, the first Oñate, the first Hispanic uh, came through New Mexico, he encountered 400 um, villages um, in New Mexico. And they ran an um, archaeological survey for that. And they said, Diane, you're pretty close. We found 399. Mm -hmm. And that only means 399 that have been excavated. So there's that many more that probably two to three times as many that are unexcavated. So it, it it's something I think that we've grown up with that we know we're part of this land, or the land is part of us, but when we read or go to other museums and see something different, it, it kind of doesn't ring right with us, and, but a lot of times it, there isn't an opportunity to correct that, and I think you as teachers have that opportunity. So what I wanted to add on to that was I came from California and then I played softball with a, one of my teammates was an archaeologist and then you know we'd been taught one thing that was very different than the reality and then I went was able in college to take uh, Native American history uh, language arts and history classes and but then this uh, teammate um, they dug a little deeper and found that this tribe that was, only had two survivors left um, in our area, there was evidence of another tribe having come along and, and all this information. So I just wanted to, because it's a history focus, um, even within your culture wanting to know, being outside wanting to know that information is the best information we have at this time. And that was fascinating to be, um, you know, have this person, you know, making this discovery. And that's just one of many discoveries of more knowledge to be gained. And I felt very fortunate. So I feel like you could apply that, what is there yet to discover? And, um, and thank you, and I'm glad you hold on to your culture. And then just to end, I think there's a few, PBS has a few, had a few series that are really good. Um, Native America, I think it was like a six part series um, that covers a lot of different areas um, and different tribes. Um, that's a good one if your students are looking at something like that. Um, for Pueblo specifically, there's the Chaco one where it talks about Chaco, the architects, the science, um, the history of it. And then more notably focused st strictly on Pueblos is the Canes of Power. It kind of explains our governmental system and how we've been established and how um, we don't, we haven't, as we went through, we didn't necessarily experience as much, a deeper trauma of being removed from our homelands like our, um, the other nations have. Um, and it goes into that. Yes. Um, Thor, can I ask you just to forward a couple slides? Because the last part is, uh, yeah, these two. So these are two different exhibits on boarding schools. And so if you could just, and this one's a terrible picture, but. Um, oh, talk on the boarding so school. So there's, there's this one and then the next slide. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, no, that, I think. I think they were both on boarding schools, yeah. but this is the one that uh, they include quotations, primary sources from the native students, and the other one is quotations and primary sources from the teachers and administrators. 
and sort of the difference in. Okay, so this one, the, so, I I, I, but I mean, I, I like the boarding school era only because there's a lot to learn from that era. I mean, it was, you know, during the time, too, of termination, mm -hmm. and so when, you know, Native kids were being sent off to these schools, you know, they were being restricted from speaking their language, from dressing how they, you know, how their tribe, you know, was, um, was kind of culturally dressing, and, you know, like, because I, well, for me, I went to a boarding school at Santa Fe, and, you know, I kind of, you know, it was interesting just to see like, you know, to look at history and see how that boarding school era was, you know, just a really horrific, you know, era. But to be in a boarding school modern day, you know, it's like they're taking a lot of stuff back. Like they're, you know, really advocating or really um, kind of, kind of not disciplining, but they're really, you know, enforcing, you know, students to really get in touch with their culture, to really get, you know, going, you know, participating and, you know, they... Um, they just really are really great with, you know, being, um, uh, how would you say, I guess being lenient with you if like, you know, you know, we have activities that go on, they're really understanding that, you know, participation is huge, but, you know, with the boring school era, it really was a sensitive time because, you know, we were being stripped away from, you know, our culture ties and our languages and, you know, that's something that we're revitalizing is our languages because in that era alone, we lost a lot of it. And, you know, if you um, look at Karis and how that's kind of, you know, it's a strong language and, you know, it's also very kind of hard to teach it because it's oral taught. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a really, you know, really kind of, I don't want to say complicated, but it's a really, you know, hard language to learn because, you know, it's not written and there's no curriculum for it. And it's, it's, but, you know, modern days, you know, we have technology to revitalize it to help us, you know, really going. But, you know, that boarding school era was, it was really an interesting era, I should say. I'd like to follow up on, the, on that. Uh, boarding school thing because there were several um, facets to it. One is where um, the first, um, one of the first boarding schools was set up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania and that was where they were taking force by force a lot of Indian children and um, sometimes they were young adults because I've looked through the, the Santa Fe Indian school records and um, like because my mom and dad and different aunts and uncles went there. And um, I asked them like how old they were. And they were like in their late teens to maybe early 20s. Um, because we, again, the Pueblos were kind of in the, if you were born probably in after the 30s, 40s, someplace in there, you were still at home. It was still agricultural. We were kind of being left alone. And when we went, when people went to Santa Fe Indian School, um, they didn't go there voluntarily. Sometimes they were dragged there, but they were close to home. But the Santa Fe Indian School underwent a transformation where um, they became more open to Indian families, that they even built um, homes and a hogan on the campus so that families could stay there when they visited their children or that the children could visit them. And then I asked my mom, because she went there, um, I said, did people run away? And she goes, oh, yeah, we ran away. She said, but we always, it was always during a feast day. And it was either right down the road or right, right up the road. Uh -huh. And people would come back the next day or, or two days later or that weekend. And um, at the Santa Fe Indian School at a certain period, which is, again, in the 40s, probably the 40s, they emphasized Native American um, skills like the the women were taught girls were taught to weave they were taught to do pueblo embroidery by pueblo experts and and to do that kind of embroidery is is a technique in itself so they learned to weave uh, the belts that we wear make the mantas the cotton clothing both for men and women um that we are now wearing today so it was like they, they, there was a slight transformation Compared to what I've read and heard about other schools, like the ones that were in South Dakota, the ones that were in um, 
Minnesota, um, Illinois, and elsewhere, where, the, where their whole, um, and you have to remember, this is why Indian schools were built. It was to wipe out the Indianness in the child. And um, the Santa Fe Indian School, I don't think, was that, um, what should I say, successful? Yeah. <laughs> that. And in fact, today it is owned and operated by the governors of the Pueblos. So um, we're kind of proud about that school. My daughter, when it came, when she was graduating from seventh grade, she said, I want to go to the same school that grandma went to. Mm -hmm. So, and I was thinking other schools were, but she said, no, I want to go to the same school that my grandma went to. So she went to the Santa Fe Indian School and graduated from there. I'm just curious that, well, never mind. I was no, go ahead. Well, this is it's just very interesting, but would you say that maybe like the boarding co school concept could be breaking a barrier in some, I mean, could somebody do a, um, a project on that for this year's theme? I mean, New the, Mexico boarding school. New Mexico, that's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. New Mexico boarding yeah. schools, because it is an interesting take on boarding. Because when I went to the, New the Pueblo, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, they had a whole exhibit on the boarding schools a couple years ago. And it was really interesting because it gave a different perspective than what I've always been told about boarding schools. So, okay, I was just yeah. curious about and, that. And when so it was different. Yeah, when you read about the original boarding schools, 1880s, 1870s, that was a really horrific experience. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I will have to agree. But on the other hand, when if you fast forward a couple of generations, a lot of the um, graduates from that Carlisle Indian School, especially if they were from, um, say, the New York to Georgia tribes, where, you know, you, you, you were going through this trail of tears and, you know, you, you had to opt to go to this other school. A lot of I want to say the leaders or people that are now working, say, with uh, within the federal government, either the Bureau of Indian Affairs or other Indian Health Service, are the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of some of those same um, students. So, But those people were able to return back to their reservation for the most part. And I guess they were trying to figure out how to survive and how to take what was best of what they could hold on to from their own native culture and maybe what to reject or what to modify from the Carlisle Indian School. But the Carlisle Indian School, I would say, was, was the worst experience, one of the worst experiences um, to Indian children and families and nations here in the United States. And, and it cannot be, I don't think it can be forgiven at all. Um, Stephanie, can I weigh in for a second? Mm -hmm. Just because I was talking about this with a different student who's she's really obsessed with India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So she wanted, you know, every year she says, oh, I'm going to do an India Pakistan project. And so Carlin and I came back after talking with her, and I was like, well, you can't really talk about partition as breaking a barrier. So sometimes with these things, the way to approach it is to help the students sort of reframe where the barrier is and what that barrier is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may not be the boarding school that, that was the barrier. It may be the government's prejudice against Native people that was the barrier. I mean, and sort of some of it is helping those students think really hard about you know, what was built to keep that communication or to keep that transaction from happening? What was, what was it trying to block? Oh, one of the things that I would recommend is, it's only coming from me because I'm an archivist at the Laboratory of Anthropology, Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. We have quite um, both archival and in collections of Indian school paintings by Native Americans. Um, and the art that we see there is to us now that we look at it because most of us have um, relatives that we only heard about but we didn't know that they actually painted these items because we don't have them in our own homes. And to go to the museum and see these paintings that say my uncle painted or that another person working with me that her great grandmother painted in the early 1900s, before there was an Indian school, that she attended an Indian school, is very impact, very impacting. 
because we've only heard of them, but we've never seen them. Um, so there is a wealth of resources and topics that could be explored, like breaking the barrier is, is how, how this Pueblo woman and other, maybe seven other artists, managed to paint um, drawings that are now okay for the, Pueblo, for the public to see. And that should be shared with everyone because it just reflects back on it. What, when I see them, it shows our strength. Mm -hmm. It might be about corn grinding. It might be about harvesting. It might just be a scene of, of men making moccasins the old time way. But it brings back, it reinforces a lot of strengths that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be shared with everybody else. Really actually a unique perspective on finding some good topics too that you know to teach other people that no one else knows about which we you know as NHD teachers we're always looking for those topics so that'd be so interesting. And the end of the Carlisle um, boarding school would be a breaking a barrier wouldn't it? And that would you know yeah that would, that would be the I think the breaking the barrier. Thank you.